May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. Into many pieces because intellectually we have arrived at our own conclusions or deductions which invariably is bound to divide because intellect is essentially a knife which cuts. It can only dissect. By dissection, you can know certain things. But if you really want to know someone that you love, you don't dissect them, you embrace them. <laughs> By dissection, you may know the kidney, liver, heart stuff, but you will not know that being in any sense. You will lose it completely. So dissection is the way of the intellect because it is a sharp instrument. It has to cut, it, cut open everything that's given to it. But the East found another way. Out of profoundness of experience, you can know life. By turning inward, you can know life. When I say turning inward, you must understand that essentially the five sense organs are always outward. You can see what's around you, but you cannot roll your eyeballs inward and scan yourself. You can hear this, but so much activity in this body, you cannot hear this. If an ant crawls upon this hand, you can feel it. So much blood flowing, you cannot feel it. Because in the very nature of things, sense organs are outward bound. The moment you dedicate yourself to your intellect, you also get enslaved to the limitations of your five senses. It is in this context, the wisdom of the East is of tremendous significance to the world because it has transcended this slavery to sense perception and learned to perceive life in a completely different way. What is this completely different way? In English language, if you say mind, it is just one word, it is supposed to say everything. In the yogic culture, there are sixteen parts to the mind, sixteen dimensions of human mind. Now if I go into sixteen, it would take too much time, so let me compress it into four. The four aspects of the mind are called buddhi, ahankara, manas and chitta. Buddhi means the intellect. Today, modern world is largely run by the intellect. So with this, we can do many things on the outside. We can go on enhancing the comforts and conveniences of life. We've done very well in terms of comforts and conveniences. Never before, never ever before, another generation of humanity ever knew the kind of comforts and conveniences that we have today. But at the same time, we are whining like never before. Because as the comforts and convenience increase on the outside, as there is less to complain about what is happening around you, the emptiness of within echoes within you in a horrible way. When you're fighting for survival, when every day you are struggling to fix small things on the outside, you will not realize this. When outside is well settled, that is when you'll see how hollow life has become. The biggest question in the world, you will see in the next few decades is, what the hell are we doing here anyway? Because everything that needs to be fixed on the outside is done, now what? 7.2 billion people on the planet, but right now gradually it's looming large. Loneliness is one of the biggest problems. Dogs are being tortured to fulfill human loneliness <laughs> Because as you dedicate yourself more and more to your intellect, you will naturally become more and more lonely because it keeps on dissecting and cutting life into various pieces for examination and then you will see you yourself will be split up into many parts after some time, if you go by the intellect, hundred percent. The next dimension of 
the mind is referred to as ahankara, normally people think it means ego. No, it means identity. You're identified with something. The moment you're identified with something, your intellect will work only to protect that identity, no matter what, whichever way you think. Your ideas of which nation you belong to, which race you belong to, which culture you belong to, which religion you belong to, which gender you belong to, the moment you get identified, your intellect will work only to protect that identity. So, it is a certain kind of prejudice. Well, you may say, I am not prejudiced, I am very broad-minded, all right, it's a broad prejudice <laughs> Because people are willing to live and die for what they are identified with. Because the nature of the intellect is, if you take away the identity, it will not know what to do. It needs a strong identity, a strong sense of who I am. If you ask, who am I? your intellect will not function. You must know who you are, <laughs> a strong sense of belief that this is what I am, that is when your intellect will function in a certain way. This is like… intellect is like a sharp knife, a hankara or the identity is the hand that holds it. All the suffering on the planet, when was the last time that somebody stabbed you, even though you're living in L.A., I'm asking <laughs> When was the last time it happened? Never happened. Maybe when you were in school, somebody poked you with a pin at the most, or they… even that did not happen, they ignored you <laughs> Or what I'm saying is, how much suffering for a human being is actually coming from outside, almost nothing. Rest is all self-help <laughs> because this is a sharp knife given to you, unsteady hand, every day it's cutting itself. You know, we were <laughs> we were trekking in uh, Nepal and Tibet region and I was in a tent. Someone was cutting an apple and someone else, another person says, this is a very sharp knife, be careful. It irritates me because it's such an obvious thing. You call it a knife only because it's sharp. <laughs> if the damn thing is not sharp, why will I call it a knife <laughs> And if it's a child, yes, a full-grown man, you don't tell him it's a sharp knife. I ignored it and I was working on something. Another two minutes again, it is said, it's a very sharp knife, be careful. I said, come on, leave him alone <laughs> He's a grown man, leave him alone. This is, he's not handling some super instrument, a knife. He should know how to handle a knife. No, no Sadhguru, it's a very sharp knife. All right, I get back to my work. Two minutes later, he cuts his hand <laughs> Okay <laughs> Now, the problem is just this. You've been given a sharp knife, unsteady hand, every day cutting yourself. You may call it stress, you may call it anxiety, you may call it fear, you may call it misery, you call it what you want. All that's happening is, your intellect is working against you, that's all it is. Unless somebody is stabbing you from outside, that's a different issue, we need to deal with that differently. Rest is all your own intelligence turning against you. You may call it a thousand… No, no, my mother-in-law, my boss, my neighbor, my neighbor, they're… they're not stabbing you, they're only saying what they want to say. It is you who's poking yourself because an unsteady hand, that's all. But this intellect cannot function without a memory bank, so what is called as manas is a silo of memory. There are eight dimensions of memory, let's not go into the detail, but you know this much, 
there is a conscious memory. Today they're recognizing a subconscious memory. You know there is genetic memory. You may not remember how your great-great-great-grandfather looked like but his nose is sitting on your face. <laughs> a million years ago how your forefathers were, even today your body remembers. You may not remember here, but your body remembers every aspect of it. Even the color of the skin it is remembering, not forgotten. So there is genetic memory, there is evolutionary memory. Like this there's a profound dimension of memory in the body. There are trillion times more memory in your body than in your mind. So this is why this is called as manomaya kosha. This is an entire manas, not in one place. Intellect may be up here, but the manas spreads right through the system. Every cell in the body has a memory of its own, has an intelligence of its own. Now the fourth dimension of intelligence is called chitta. This is a dimension of intelligence which is unsullied by memory. If you touch this dimension, then the memory has no influence on you. Your genetic memory, your evolutionary memory, your conscious memories, unconscious memory, subconscious memory, whatever kinds of memories you have, it has no influence on you. Or in other words, past cannot recycle itself through you. See, right now, you take on this form because of a certain memory, it's a certain software. If you eat, let's say you're a man and you eat a piece of bread, this piece of bread turns into a man. You're a woman and you eat a piece of bread, the same piece of bread turns into a woman. You give it to your dog, it turns into your dog. Very intelligent bread <laughs> I think a sabbatical. <laughs> is good <laughs> He may come up with something that you've not thought possible <laughs> I will… I will convey your message, Jai Sadhguru. I'm sure he's watching this program <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, I believe that talent is something which is grossly exaggerated in success. It's… when I was in medical school, I used to teach martial art. Uh, that was my passion <laughs> And uh, every time a Bruce Lee's movie was released, all these school kids would come and join in hordes to martial arts schools. We used to call it Bruce Lee They're phenomenon. gone after two weeks. <laughs> yes. And I used to see some kids whose physique is meant for martial art, who have the natural flair and I used to think, oh, this kid is going to get a black belt. And interestingly, Swamiji, mm -hmm. after six months, they're never there. The guys who go up to the black belt and, you know, do something very good in martial art are the ones who join the school without any skills, without any talent, who worked very, very hard for everything they had to sweat it out, but in the end, they are the ones who succeed. How do you explain this phenomenon? <clears throat> See, uh, for a variety of reasons, let me not go beyond this, for a variety of reasons, a certain individual could be born with a certain flair, physical flair, mental flair, emotional flair, style, you know, five-year-old child, one has style, other is clumsy, okay? <laughs> so the one with the style is not going to become necessarily a fashion thing. Somebody else who seems to be clumsy may grow into something else. Like, uh, you don't know when a woman is pregnant, the child within that womb, whether it's a sage or a sorcerer, not the woman now. No, the mother does not know whether she is producing a sage or a sorcerer or what. This is because I use the word coherence because of modern science is using that word. Who you are here right now, as you sit here, 
This is physics. Every subatomic particle is in constant contact with everything. What you call as cosmos is living life and it's a live mind. You have captured only one small part of it. If you work with only that one smart, small part of what you have captured, both as life and as intelligence, you will function at a certain level. If you apply yourself to break the barriers of your limitations that you've set for yourself, then there is an intelligence beyond anybody's understanding, beyond anybody's estimate which is available to you. Once this is available to you, people think you're superhuman. No, this is not about being superhuman. This is about realizing that being human is super. The immensity of being human has not been realized. So we are always making a, a kind of a mathematical calculation. Okay, if this person has this much IQ, maybe this is what he will become. This is what Newton's law, that everything that moves on this planet works to a mathematical precision or a geometric precision. That is, if you take a pendulum, the length of the pendulum will decide how it will swing. If you take a projectile, depending upon its mass, velocity and uh, the, pr the trajectory, it will go to a certain place. That is not how the cosmos is working because what you think is physical and not physical is all mixed up within this, within this human being. The physical self, the psychological self, the emotional self and who you call as myself, the life within you, the fundamental life process, these are all different dimensions and the innermost core of who you are which because all the other words are corrupted, I'll use the word life or just you, what you call as me. This, if you allow it, if you do not identify it with any form, with your physical form or with other different identities that you take on, it has a, a way of being cohesive or collaborative with everything around. When we say somebody worked hard, all he is trying to do is stretch his boundary of identity, isn't it? He's trying to stretch his boundary. If he succeeds to set, stretch his boundary, something that was… he never thought possible or imagined that is within his competence or capability becomes his. Miraculously, I can show you hundreds of people who come to me, we prepare them for a certain period and then we initiate them. In twenty-four hours, you will see the shape of their face will change. Genetics are altered in twenty-four hours' time. You can see the photographic images, they have actually changed dramatically overnight simply because of a certain extension of their identity. So, in the Indian spiritual milieu, so when you say spiritual, we must understand this. This is not about looking up or looking down. When we say spiritual, we are talking about transcending the limitations of physical. So right now, the physical is here as if it's a solid entity in people's experience. But modern physics is telling you and medical science is beginning to telling, tell you, or if people don't understand, if they just hold their nose for two minutes, they understand that they are not an independent existence. It is in transaction, not just in terms of breath. Even on the level of subatomic particles, it's in constant transaction. If this transaction becomes even minutely conscious, suddenly you have immense capabilities that you never thought were possible. Biological identity is the most limiting identity that you have because it limits to the area of your body. Now when you strive, you break this. It doesn't matter in what way you strive. Most people strive in unconscious, unscientific, simply out of striving, they do things. But there are ways to strive scientifically in a proper way. There are tools to strive with specific direction to break the limitations of who we are. If you break this boundary, the subatomic particles are transacting, the intelligence is transacting, only you're missing the whole game. If you don't miss the game, if you are in the game of life, not in the game of thoughts and emotions, you are in the game of life, suddenly just about anything you want, you can do, not this or that. I'm saying anything can a human being can do, simply if he breaks his barriers. And these barriers are many levels, but the most fundamental thing is the identity. And it has tremendous memory. If I open this water, even without opening, if I say something to this water, it remembers.
there has been lot of experiments in this direction. So, uh, if you take this water from wherever the waterworks is and pump it to your house, let's say it went through fifty bends, forced, pumped forcefully with a certain force, which naturally is done, and you are living on twelfth floor of the apartment, so further forced up. Now they are saying, if it goes through fifty bends, about sixty percent of the water has turned poisonous. Immediately when it comes in the tap, if you take it and immediately drink it, it will work as poison in your system. If you take it and hold it for some time, it will undo itself again. Because the poisoning is not chemical, it is molecular. Molecular changes are happening, no chemical change is happening. This is why traditionally your grandmother always told you, always you must gather the water, keep it overnight in your house, in a properly cleaned vessel with vibhuti and kunkum on it and one flower on it. Yes or no? In traditional homes? Only tomorrow morning you drink it. Not as soon as it comes inside your house, you don't drink it because it carries all kinds of memories. In very traditional homes, people every day do puja to the water pot. Yes? And you never drink the water as soon as it comes, you keep it, give it enough time to undo itself from whatever nonsense it has gathered so that it is suitable for you when you drink it. Water you must take care because it's seventy-two percent. It's more, it's first class, you know, more than passing mark. Next thing is food because that's the earth, twelve percent. One more thing if you want to do, you just light an organic oil lamp, a cotton wick, some oil, anything. What do you use here? Normal cooking oil. Linseed oil, rice bran oil or sesame oil, what do you have? Olive oil. Olive oil, fine. Any organic oil with a cotton wick, just burn one little lamp somewhere in the room where you sleep you will see these things will completely disappear. If you can bring in a chant or there are nightly practices, yogic practices, before you go to bed, sit on your bed and do this practice. Do you know, in about… if you live for about sixty years, you're… on an average most human beings are eating anywhere between eleven hundred to fourteen hundred tons of food. So that means even what you think is my body is not this, it's changing every day. New input is happening and old things are going away. So fourteen hundred tons, you don't have to carry that much of weight right now. So obviously what you have as a body right now is just a transient amount of food and soil, isn't it? Hello? So what you think is mine also is not it, it is just all the time changing. Tonight before you go to bed, spend at least twelve, fifteen minutes reminding yourself, you're neither this body nor this mind. Just lie down and just remind yourself, this body is not really you. It is mine right now for use, but it's not really me. Just… if you're not able to do it, just link it to your breath. Inhalation, I'm not the body. Exhalation, I'm not even the mind. Just lie down for twelve minutes and do it till the last moment till you fall asleep. This is something you must notice. Yes or no? There are joyful people and miserable people, but there are no good people and bad people. <laughs> the… the moment we think we are good, we are entitled to destroy the bad, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we've been destroying a lot of people for a long time. Time to stop that <laughs> because human beings are in different levels of experience and understanding, variety of people. Anybody who is not like you is obviously bad, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it so? Those who are not like me must be bad people. Because the basis of goodness and what you think is goodness is decided by you. Mm -hmm. 
No, you have no business to do that. Willing means this, I'm just willing. I'm a hundred percent yes to life. I am not yes to this one, no to this one, no. I am just yes and yes to life. If you are a hundred percent yes to life, you are a volunteer. Oh, that's you have become a willing life. You have become so willing that you have no will of your own. People ask me, Sadhguru, how do you operate with all these people? All kinds of horrible questions they're asking, they're doing this, they're doing that. I said, my life is not about them, it's about me. It's about how I am. It's about me. It doesn't matter how they are, that's their choice. But how I am is my choice, this is my way. No matter what they do, I'm like this. Because I have not given that freedom to anybody, that somebody can freak me, somebody can make me angry, somebody can make me happy, somebody can make me unhappy, these privileges I kept to myself. It's time you do that too, because if somebody else can decide what can happen within you right now, isn't this the ultimate slavery? Huh? Isn't this? Someone else can decide what should happen within you. What happens around you, of course, sim so many people decide. Hmm? What happens around us is not hundred percent ours, but what happens within me must be my making, isn't it? Right now, just about anybody can freak anybody because they're not volunteers, they're unwilling. Mm -hmm. Volunteering means you have no will of your own, you can do whatever is needed. You know, we are a volunteer organization, this means uh, all kinds of people. <laughs> Most of them are not qualified for the jobs that they're doing <laughs> And I cannot fire them because they're volunteers <laughs> <laughs> so people keep coming up to me on a daily basis, they say, Sadhguru, I can't work with this person, she's so horrible, I can't do it. I tell them, see, in this world, this is the sort of people who exist, like this, like this, like this, like this, this is the kind of people there are. But if you want to work with ideal people, you must go to heaven. And today, <laughs> and today. <laughs> but if you think what you're doing is very significant, you must learn to work with all these horrible people. Many problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere after 3 a.m. At that time, if you sit up and do whatever process you have been initiated for, it will bear maximum fruit. In the way the planet is spinning and what is happening, something very fundamental changes somewhere between 320 to 340. This is called Brahma Mahurtam. This is relevant only up to thirty-three degrees latitude. Your system, human system, functions in a certain way. It is a possibility. So, uh, there has been an awareness about making use of this possibility. Your life is a product of Many things that we call as the universe, many things that we call as existence. So we are a consequence of a certain phenomenal happening that we call as cosmos. We are not an individual existence. So when you get in sync, certain things will happen. You know, there's a <coughs> cicadius in uh, where we are in Tennessee, the U.S. ashram, they wake up once in seventeen years. Can you beat it? They know it is seventeen years and they come awake and they breed and they go back to sleep. They're keeping time once in seventeen years, no alarm bell anywhere. Well, how is this? 
I'm saying they are in sync with nature. We have lost sync within nature and we think that is our nature. No. All the many ailments, many problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces which are making us who we are. So yoga is to bring that sync so that you are in rhythm with life. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere just after three a.m. If you're conscious, suddenly a certain spark of aliveness will happen within you. Even if you're in deep sleep, you will come awake. This must happen to you. This means you're falling in sync with it. You're falling in sync with life. So what should I do? Should I meditate? Should I do a Kriya? Doesn't matter what, you must do a process for which you have been initiated for. Because initiation means you were not just taught a practice, it was introduced into your system, it was implanted in your system. So whatever, if there is a life seed within you, if you are awake at Brahma Mahartam and sit for whatever that practice is, it bears maximum fruit because of the way the planet is behaving in relation to your system. If you become aware in a certain way, a certain level of awareness is achieved within you, you will see, you will simply know when that time is. If you go to bed at the right time, you don't have to look at your watch. You will always know when it is 3.40 because the body will behave in a different way. At that time, if you sit up and do whatever process you have been initiated for, not what you picked up from a book, it will bear maximum fruit. The seed will get the necessary support at that time for it to sprout or spurt up more rapidly than, you, uh, than at other times. This is only for the initiated. If you are not initiated, you are a book yogi, then 3.40, 6.40, 7.40, not so much of a difference. Sandhya colors are more important for such people. Sandhya means twenty minutes before sunrise, twenty minutes after sunrise, or twenty minutes before sunset and twenty minutes after sunset. The same goes for noon and midnight, but they are of a different nature. So these two twilights, are better for the uninitiated. 3.40 is good for those who have been powerfully initiated. Keep this in your mind, that you are truly a mortal, okay? Not in words, really, you could fall dead right now. Uh, you may be young, you may be old, it doesn't matter, you can fall dead right now. Yes or no? Before you go to bed, sit on your bed, and think this is your deathbed. You have just one more minute to live. Just look back and see, what you have done today, is it worthwhile? Just do this one simple exercise. And you don't know when it really happens, whether you'll be sitting on your deathbed or lying in a hospital, all kinds of things sticking into you. Who knows how it'll happen? But enjoy this every day, that you'll sit on your deathbed, look back and see today, the way I've handled these twenty-four hours, is it worthwhile? Because now I'm dying. If you do this, you will live a worthwhile life, believe me. So every day in the night, all of you should do this before you go to bed. Last three minutes, everything that you have gathered, the body, the content of the mind, things, don't ignore small things, these small things are big things. I've seen how people are carrying their 
their own private pillow, you know. <laughs> because it's very important. <laughs> so, your pillow, your footwear, if you have relationships, everything that you have gathered, keep it aside, sleep. If you sleep in that condition, you will wake up with much more light, with much more energy, with much more possibilities than you have imagined possible. Just sleep as life, not as a man, not as a woman, not as this and that. Keep everything down, simply. See, I'm, this is getting too easy. Just sleeping sadhana. Hmm? At least this you must do. Visionary Women is a volunteer-run uh, organization and I know that every single person who is here is giving their time to one organization or another. And the fact that you have nine million volunteers and you were talking about the relationship between volunteerism and willingness and that it's through willingness that you uplift your consciousness, if I'm quoting you correctly or I'm understanding it. In some ways, talking about how it could be a doorway to becoming a bigger person than mm -hmm. who you are. See, uh, before we come to women, first thing is visionary. What a vision, and vision means is, see everybody has desires. Desire is an incre incremental way of enhancing our life. Today you desire, I must have a home, tomorrow you desire, I must have this money, tomorrow you desire something else. These are incremental ways of arranging and rearranging our lives, mm -hmm. which are needed to do a few things. When you say, I'm a visionary, what you are saying is, I have a larger desire, which is not about just incremental improvement of my life. Desire is about me always. Vision is an all-inclusive all process. So, this itself is a phenomenal thing. If people, instead of having desires, if they have a vision, mm -hmm. vision is always all-inclusive. Desire is personal. Desire leads to incremental changes and improvements. Vision can transform the whole situation. I like music <laughs> So, uh, about willingness, because you said you're a volunteer organization, to be a volunteer. A volunteer means somebody who is doing something willingly, right? There's no other compulsion. There are no financial compulsions, there are no social compulsions, there is no something else. You want to do something willingly. So when you're a willing participant right now, you're a volunteer. I'm asking all of you, right now, are you compelled to be here or are you here voluntarily? Oh, well, thank you <laughs> Because I've sp spoken to conscripted people also. He knows his strength is gone on the football field because there are younger boys who are running. So you've not seen Messi or Ronaldo in all the games. It is just that, who is able to extract the best out of the given situation? Namaskaram Sadhguru, you are a football fan. In your view, who is better between Messi and Ronaldo? See, this is the whole thing. On a given day, maybe I can play better than Messi. But that doesn't make me better than him because he's got... He's climbed through the steps, all right? One ball, if he kicks into the goal, it may go above the goal. If I kick, it may go in. So I'll say, I'm better than Messi. It doesn't work like that. So it's not who is better than whom. It is just that, who is able to extract the best out of the given situation? Well, because you're talking about an international game, Messi has had the fortune, I would say, to win that game. Because as everybody could see, he's lost his pace. Still got fantastic skills, but he doesn't have speed, he's not able to run with the young boys. 
not able to retain the ball, but he's very good, so he realizes that. He's not a fool to try to outrun those young boys and kill himself. He's just giving the necessary passes and making the difference. That's a smart man, isn't it? Very smart man. He's not thinking I should score. He's just making sure the ball is in the right place so that somebody scores. So he's using his skills. He knows his strength is gone on the football field because there are younger boys who are running, you know, always two, three steps ahead of him. So, this whole thing about now what you're asking is, is a jasmine flower better or a rose flower better? So you've not seen Messi or Ronaldo in all the games. If you see both of them in variety of club games that they've played, which is where their skills were largely exhibited, in international games they're little out of place because it's not their regular teammates. Uh, international games are little rougher, not by the rule, because national emotions are there. These fine players cannot play very well there. Ruffians play better <laughs> Very fine players cannot play very well in international games. In the club games, everybody is a professional. They play a certain level of game. There they will excel. So both of them have excelled beautifully in their clubs. Well, sometimes when you made a wrong choice of entering a wrong club and stuff, even if you're a great player, say Ronaldo sits on the bench in Manchester, Manchester United, because issues, other issues other than football will come up. Ronaldo did his best, but towards the end, I think...